Okay, thank you everyone for coming. I'm, I'm very happy to have with us uh, Paul Vixi, who is uh, Vice President, Distinguished Engineer at Amazon Web Services Security and Director at SIE Europe, and most importantly, an Internet Hall of Famer for his work on DNS, uh, DNSSEC, uh, author of open source software such as Bind, Cron, I mean, many of the foundation of modern Internet. So, and, and Paul, today we'll talk about the quick protocol. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. <clears throat> uh, this is a dry topic to some, but I think it will be of interest to you. If you have not been following it, you may even be surprised. Um, so before I begin, I'll say that as far as I know, no one working at Amazon would disagree with what I'm about to say. This is, however, not Amazon's opinion uh, in any official capacity. This is me. Uh, going around the world talking about the things that worry me, this being one. Now, all of us have been using TCP IP uh, ever since the flag day when we got away from NCP. Uh, and so it's what we're familiar with, and we may even say that TCP IP is synonymous with the Internet itself. Um, it's not. It turns out the IP part is synonymous with the Internet itself, but you can do a lot of things inside of IP besides using TCP. And, um, you know, given that there are, uh, we now have decades of experience with TCP, it makes sense that we'd be thinking about how to replace it. You know, what are the big problems TCP has had? Uh, you know, where, what should we do differently next time, and so on. That, that thinking has led to this protocol uh, as de defined in RFC 9000 in, uh, from the IETF. Uh, it, however, is going to have some performance and security implications for uh, secure private networks, uh, edge networks that are not ISP based. Um, and you know, certainly the research and engineering and education communities would all be examples of this where, um, you know, there are security policies in place. To the extent that our security policies have depended on TCP, we need to be prepared to rethink what we're doing and even to rethink what is possible. So QUIC, Q-U-I-C, no longer stands for anything. It used to be an acronym. Um, but what it amounts to is a reliable transport protocol, reliable in the same sense that TCP was reliable, but it is built on top of UDP uh, rather than being a separate IP protocol as TCP and UDP both are. Um, it was craft, crafted in the, uh, in the aftermath of the uh, disclosures by Edward Snowden, a U.S. Co uh, contractor to the um, Security Administration, the NSA. Uh, in 2013, Mr. S Mr. Snowden uh, famously flew to Hong Kong and made a lot of disclosures, which panicked a lot of people. And uh, the result inside the IETF was a 10-year program uh, to encrypt everything and to make the type of uh, upstream uh, surveillance and, and, and monitoring that TCP was clearly facilitating to, to make that impossible. And so this is a, an IETF-wide effort. Uh, it is something the Internet Activities Board and the Internet Steering Group and so forth are, are all getting behind, which is... Um, that pervasive monitoring is an attack, and the Internet is for end users. Uh, those are the guiding principles of this new era. There will be some changes, as I said, for us. Um, TCP is normally a part of your kernel. Uh, it may be a loadable kernel module, but it is nevertheless running in supervisor mode on whatever is your, your laptop or your, your server. And uh, this gives us some nice properties. Uh, in particular, if you have endpoint uh, detection and response, so-called EDR, which I think used to be called anti-malware or um, antivirus, 
you can instrument the kernel so that when a certain system call, for example, the connect or accept system call, is made, then you can stop briefly in some kind of an EDR uh, module and say, well, I see that this app is trying to connect to a certain place or it's trying to accept a, a connection from a certain place. How do we feel about that place? Is this good for us or bad for us? Or maybe we don't know. Um, but if, you, if it's bad and you know it's bad, then you could actually cause that system call to fail. Um, this turns out to be pretty um, lame. This is a terrible way to do security. And if we were designing this uh, freshly with a, an empty whiteboard and we could do whatever we want, this is not the outcome we would get. This outcome has come step by step, bit by bit, as the only thing that we, the only control we really have. Um, so we're using it, but I don't want to sound like I was proud of it. Um, uh, one of the things that is said to be great about Quick is that it is in user mode, right? The, your user mode application simply opens a UDP socket uh, through the kernel and then just transmits and receives opaque, well-encrypted data uh, out into the network itself. Um, so one advantage of this is, let's say your TCP implementation is old and slow or that there's something going on, maybe buffer bloat. There, there could be a number of different things, uh, some kind of congestion control that is missing or outdated. Um, waiting for your kernel vendor to fix TCP so that all of your applications can benefit from the fix uh, hasn't been a, <laughs> a reliable, efficient way to move the world forward. So this is now seen as a way to bypass the... Uh, the latency of kernel development and just say, hey, my web browser has the transport protocol built into it. And so all the congestion control that I want, whatever it is I want to do, I'll just do in the next version of the app. And then the kernel can pretty much ignore me and just move my packets back and forth without knowing what they are. Um, that, in fact, may, uh, may be a necessary benefit. Uh, it is not the primary motive and it has some significant uh, side impacts. Uh, so I mentioned the lack of the ability to know when a connection is being made or accepted uh, because all, all the kernel will see and therefore all the endpoint detection response software will see is that you are receiving a UDP packet that's well encrypted or you're transmitting one. And it may be that the payload, which has been well encrypted using application level uh, crypto, uh, is in fact a request to open a connection or an acknowledgement that, uh, that you're accepting a connection. But there's no way for the kernel to know that. The data is not only well encrypted, it's padded, so you can't tell by the length or by anything else where uh, connection negotiation is occurring in the flow. Um, and uh, again, the, uh, the crypto is all user mode, and so it is expected to be very difficult to recover the keys and to observe uh, renegotiation of keys in the TLS protocol uh, inside the kernel. Um, and to the extent that that turns out to be possible, we can expect the quick protocol to be revised in order to make that not possible. So this will be an arms race between those of us who are using the behavior of our applications to uh, both measure and control the security of our system or of our uh, private edge net network, uh, to the extent that we win, uh, there will be a moving target and there will be a new version in the next version of that browser or something that then frustrates our desire to know what's going on. Our desire to know what is going on is considered a threat. The Internet is for end users now. Um, so what does this mean for us, for networks like this one, uh, or your average government agency, your average commercial network? Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I will talk about these difficulties and somebody will say, you know, if you're using a firewall, uh, it's not helping you in the way you think it is. So it's a false sense of security 
And yes, we're going to take that away from you because everything is going to look the same. All you'll be able to see is that it's UDP port 443. might not even be port 443. Uh, they can negotiate that. Um, and so your firewall will not know the difference between one purpose and another of some network signal, so you might as well just turn it off. But you should have turned it off anyway because you, you need to secure your endpoints. That's what people keep telling me. But I can't secure my endpoints, right? Uh, although this is an Apple laptop, they used a lot of uh, BSD and other uh, open source code to build their operating system, but it's not completely open. It's got a lot of proprietary stuff in there. Apple is capable of securing my endpoints, but I'm not. Same thing for all the little IoT devices that we have. Um, I'm sure you've all heard that uh, a Chinese-made baby camera, uh, you know, a camera that you put in the baby's room so that you can monitor your, your baby while she sleeps, uh, turned out to be uh, susceptible to uh, some kind of zero day, and uh, all of a sudden millions of these cameras started joining botnets and participating in DDoS. I can't secure those endpoints either. Um, so I kind of need my firewall. I know it's lame. I just... I don't have much, right? We're, we're, we're on the precipice. We, this is the last thing we had, and it's being taken, so I'm taking that a little bit personally. Um, and, you know, as an example, I control the use of DNS on my networks, so I don't allow devices to just bypass my own local DNS server that I hand out in a DHCP configuration. Uh, they will use that one or they will fail if they send a DNS request off net and they are not doing it from the address of one of my name servers where I know that that should be allowed, then I just, it fails. And what that means, for example, is that I can't use a Chromecast at my house because they ignore the DHCP settings and always use 8888 as the DNS server for a Chromecast. Uh, so that would be another device I cannot secure. Telling me to secure my endpoints means that I should trust the corporations who build the devices that are on my network, and I know better than to do that. I can give you stories about every vendor as to how they have abused their privileges or they've been incompetent or both, and why we shouldn't trust any of it. So on our managed private networks, we need to pay attention to the behavior of devices. You know, try to imagine... Uh, somebody calls you and they say, you know, hey, you're spamming us, and you got to stop. It's like, well, I'm sure there is some device on my network that is spamming you, but it's all encrypted to me. I can't see what it was. I can't see what it's doing. I can't control what it's doing. And therefore, something important is being changed. I, I will say lost. Something important is being lost, which is that the Internet started out as a network of networks. That is what the word Internet means. And it meant that we had a whole bunch of autonomous uh, systems, aut autonomous uh, local networks, each one of which was connected to the Internet. And within that network, there would be some administrator, some set of policies, uh, maybe even a regulator or uh, an insurance company, a whole bunch of entities trying to decide how that network should behave. But now, if somebody calls and complains and says, hey, you're DDoSing me or you're spamming me, it's like all I can say is I have no idea what my network is doing. The, the network is now for the end users. It is no longer a network of networks. Uh, that is a huge change. We're, we're going through an inflection point in what it means to be an Internet. So, you know, bad actors have always tried to avoid calling attention to themselves. Uh, they want to blend in as much as possible so that they don't trigger the anomaly detection that a lot of us are using. That would be NDR, network detection and response, rather than EDR. Um, and this now, uh, un in the quick world, this will be the default. Everything is blended. Um, now, you know, I, I want to say that if you have an ISP... Uh, and that ISP is operating at uh, very thin margins. They're having a very uh, difficult time earning a profit or even paying their bills because there are so many other ISPs that want the same customers, and so everybody is in a race to the bottom. Uh, it can be a natural 
business result to then say, look, I've got to find a way to monetize the traffic passing through my ISP, otherwise I cannot afford to pay the technical people who keep it running. And that means abuse of position. That means that ISPs have been data mining, let's say, DNS flows to try to figure out what their end users are interested in. Uh, this may sound outlandish to you because uh, you're near the place where GDPR has the force of law. Uh, but in general, ISPs have abused their position and monetized our activities, violated our privacy, and not just ISPs, nation state actors, both those uh, uncovered, not uncovered, those illuminated by Edward Snowden in 2013, and also you think of China or Russia or any authoritarian state, uh, they are all monitoring what uh, their end users are doing. And so to the extent that an ISP is doing that or a nation state is doing that, uh, that's kind of abuse right there. there it's, this is not a network of national security agencies. It's a network of networks. And so if you're not one of those networks, you should not be abusing your position because if you do, you're going to provoke uh, bad feedback loops like quick. But... Um, you know, no pebble feels itself to be part of an avalanche, so uh, this is where we're going. You can't build a secure uh, site anymore. Um, all you can really do is try to pay attention to the behavior of these devices. You might say, gee, if the baby monitor is sending an awful lot of packets and it's sending it to a lot of different places and it's not just talking to the corporate mothership who, who, who built the camera, that might be an indication that it has been infected with something and that I should go unplug it or whatever. Um, but if unplugging the device is all you can do because the vendor doesn't care to hear your questions or your problem reports and you don't have the source code and, and you don't know whether to trust it, you're pretty much just going to replace it with another baby monitor and hope that one behaves differently. So you, 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 the, the idea of site security being something that you can control is a little bit outmoded. But, again, we have had something, which is that we could look at, and here's an example. Uh, you would look at a um, TCP flow on port 443, that's the HTTPS service, and you would say, okay, I know that's speaking TLS, I see the version number, and I see the uh, client hello message. That is not encrypted uh, in TLS 1.2, it's not encrypted. And the reason it wasn't encrypted is the far end might be a web complex where a single IP address is used by tens of millions of different websites, each one of which has its own TLS certificate. And so the answering server needs to know what virtual host name you think you're connecting to so that it can decide which key to offer you. Um, and, you know, once you have that data, then you might do something that, uh, I guess, Palo Alto Networks and a lot of other advanced firewalls have the ability to, um, to let you look at that and use it for policy. You might say, yeah, if, this, if the going to pornhub.com from a computer that the company owns, we're, we might just refuse to carry those, those packets. Uh, and, you know, I'm using Pornhub as, as an example. I, I have no opinion about porn. I'm just saying that a lot of companies do. Um, I know that in the UK, it is explicitly uh, required by law that an employee at work using the company's equipment must be able to do their online banking. And the only way you're going to permit those flows is if you can see the virtual host name they think they're connecting to. So if, if you begin to hide that, it begins to be hard to comply with the law. But TLS 1.3 encrypts the client hello uh, for the purpose of preventing that type of policy enforcement because it is also used by governments to either uh, monitor its citizens or even control what those citizens can do. Um, I would have preferred some kind of a negotiated middle ground instead of moving from one extreme to the other extreme. Uh, but I do want to say that behavioral security is all we had and that's going away, which means there will be none. Well, there are alternatives, but they're pretty expensive. I'll come to that. Now, we didn't build this with the intent of it being quite so complicated, but it is very complicated because uh, 
no shareholder is ever rewarded for its company removing features or removing code from the product. Right? The uh, thing that drives all of this innovation tends to be investment. And um, you know, if you're the CTO of some tech company, your bonus depends on whether you can add features. And that means you're adding code, you're adding logic, you're adding conditionals, you're adding state variables. You are making the distributed system more complicated as a side effect of meeting your management objectives. This is all natural stuff. There's nothing, uh, nothing draconian going on here. This is just humans being human. But it does mean that by now, uh, most of us know very little about what's going on even inside of a single laptop, let alone a network or a campus like this one. Um, very few people uh, know a lot. Uh, mostly, uh, people don't know anything. And if you don't know what's going on, then you can't decide uh, sort of whether your network is being used to further your interests. In other words, uh, used in a way that is aligned with your interests or uh, counter to your interests. So that should bother us because you know we're paying for these networks. Uh, they are our networks. We should be able to determine how they're used, but that's going away. So. You know, I could go very deep down this rabbit hole, but I just want to say um, the more stuff you add, the, the more combination and permutation related risks you will have, right? If, if you've got one thing that has got an extra million lines of source code that nobody remembers why they're there, and it's sharing an endpoint uh, with software, other software that also has an extra million lines of code that nobody remembers why it's there, it is possible that the combination of them will be something no one could imagine until they see it. But at least now in, in the quick world, we won't see it. It'll just happen. Um, and it's worth remembering the economics of internet security. Um, if you defend successfully, uh, your reward is that you get to defend again tomorrow, hopefully just as successfully. If you attack successfully, your reward is you get a new fancy car in your garage and you get to buy you know, better drugs or whatever it is that you want to do with the proceeds of your crime. So it's an asymmetric incentive framework. Right? The reason anything happens is that it either makes money or saves money for someone who then took action in order to obtain that result. And making money is a more powerful incentive than saving it especially because when you make money as an attacker, you know how much you made. But if you save money as a defender, you don't. You can only imagine how much you would have lost if you had not successfully defended. So that won't change. There's nothing we could do to change uh, those rules of that game. And if we were to be smart about it, we would say, if those are the invariants, let's design our systems in a way that uh, blunts the impact of that asymmetry, but we're not doing that. So firewalls are themselves uh, breakage of rules. There's nothing in the TCP IP protocol that says, and here's where the firewall fits, and here's how it should behave, and here's how it should signal what's been done. None of that exists. A firewall is created by somebody who said, hey, my network is full of stuff that I can't patch back in the 80s. And uh, you know we need to have a way to control who can do what. You might even have a simple rule like a TCP IP connection emanating from inside my network going to the outside is allowed. But if it's the other way, if a TCP IP connection wants to come into my network from the outside, then it has to be to some well-known server on some well-known TCP port. And, and if it isn't that, then we're just going to drop it. now. All of that violates the end-to-end -end principle. It is uh, kind of anti-internet stuff, but it's what had to be done in order to scale the internet to the point it now is. And um, that is uh, true of all the different monitoring we'd like to do. I mentioned uh, looking at TLS 1.2 client hello messages. There's nothing in the TLS protocol that says 
this is clear text so that it can be used in these ways. If you're using it in these ways, here's what you inject into the network in order to tell the endpoints that you are there and what you have done and why you have done it. None, no, all of it was rule breakage. Has been for 20 years. Anything we do with security uh, is taking some principle, some purity principle of uh, internet design and subverting it. Um, that's uh, that's a difficult situation. That's untenable, and we're about to stop tenanting it for that reason. If, on the other hand, you were a you know passionate twenty-something in 2013, and you saw Snowden's disclosures, and you didn't already know that governments just behave that way. All of them do. Um, they make their own rules, and that's how nation states are defined in a way: is that they make their own rules. Um, you might say that kind of dirty trick is a bad deal, and as a passionate defender of human rights, you might say we've got to make sure that none of the traffic is interceptable or even discernible by any on-path party. Uh, in the DNS over HTTPS specification on page one, it says that this protocol is designed to uh, prevent on-path interference in DNS operations. Well, guess what? I am a sysadmin, I'm a firewall admin, I'm a DNS admin, and I'm on path and I intend to interfere. So this, that RFC for DNS over HTTPS was essentially uh, telling me that I can no longer control that which I own. And if you don't control it, then uh, you're, you're missing an important element of what it would mean to own it. So there are two RFCs that describe this, 7258 and 8890. I recommend reading them. And uh, please let me know if you see something I didn't, because there's no carve-out that I saw for the idea that a secure private network, uh, an endpoint network like the one at CERN or the one in most companies, should be able to monitor anything. Um, there should, really should be a carve-out to say, you know, if you're an ISP, if it's like out in the cloud of the big cloudy thing in the middle of the Internet, then, yeah, we need to make sure that that kind of surveillance can't work. But if it's like the first hop, it's, you know, between some laptop and some gateway, um, you probably want that gateway to be able to see what's going on. Uh, they didn't care. Um, importantly, intruders now have rights. Um, the Internet is for end users, including intruders, and um, for that matter, malware has rights. Um, and that just seems a little bit naive to me, but it's coming, right? The RFCs have already been published for this. Implementation is ongoing. Um, some browsers already try this in order to find out if maybe the server they're going to supports this protocol. So it is silently deploying. Now, I fought this paragraph. Um, I was a member of this working group. And I want to say the people in the working group are just incredibly good technologists. This is a very high quality protocol. But when they were describing manageability, they wanted to say that the quick wire image is not specifically designed to be distinguishable from other UDP traffic. And that's just not true. Um, I don't mean it's a lie. I just mean that it, it lies by omission. If you read the other two RFCs that I just showed, showed you, you'll see that what needs to be written here is that the quick wire image is specifically designed to be indistinguishable from other UDP traffic. That is the truth. And if you deliberately speak something that is far less than the truth, that is misleading. Um, so there was the usual week-long battle over this wording, uh, and it was ultimately determined by the working group uh, co-chairs that the existing wording uh, would, would remain. Um, that's, a, that's a real problem. I think the IETF, if it wants to become a political entity and it wants to build things for political purposes, it should be honest about its intention. Um, so to the extent that they're not only behaving this way, but trying not to get caught behaving this way, 
that is cause for concern because they're going to keep inventing stuff. They're going to keep designing the future of our networks by designing the protocols that all of our devices speak. Now, there are also some performance problems with this. Uh, so here is TCP dump showing a couple of uh, TCP headers. And so you can see the selective ACK, and you can see the MSS, and you can see various things. Uh, load balancers, either near end or far end, uh, are known to look at these and say, aha, I see what you're doing with that window of 64K. That's not good for me. And they would actually modify that and recalculate the header checksum in flight so that the endpoint would not try to have quite so much data in, uh, in flow. Um, all of this becomes encrypted in Quickland. You can't see it, therefore you don't know what it is. You don't know if you wish you could change it. You couldn't change it if you knew that you wanted to, and you would have to learn keys that only the application knows in order to successfully modify any of it. So the idea of trying to treat TCP as part of the network and actually change the way the network behaves in order to manage traffic in a way that is you know, maybe advantageous is gone. Um, the endpoints will do as they please. I mentioned encrypted client hello. Um, I don't know what the next gen firewall people are going to do about this because right now they're looking at the uh, unencrypted client hello in TLS 1.2 and they're implementing policy based on what they see. Now, one of the things that uh, China and Russia both did is they made TLS 1.3 illegal. And because in TCP, you can, you can tell what TLS is being negotiated. It is the case in China that if you try to make a um, TLS 1.3 request, it is going to be uh, lost, it'll be dropped which means the endpoint will experience a little bit of delay while they wait for you know, some, some hope. And once they give up hope, they'll try again with 1.2. So that seems like the natural thing for an authoritarian nation state to do. And um, you know, I don't like it. I, I wish it wasn't happening, but I don't think I'm going to have a lot of success telling China how they ought to govern. I think they're going to do what they want. And the browser people um, and the, the various other the sort of uh, wizards who are behind a lot of this have said that falling back to TC TLS 1.2 is itself a weakness and that at some point browsers will refuse to fall back. I don't think that's true because I think that the, uh, the, 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 the web universe really depends on being able to sell things to people in China or buy things from people in China. And if all of a sudden you just can't because it won't fall back and TLS 1.3 won't be allowed, that's is a question of uh, who has first mover advantage and uh, who has the greatest power. I think um, browser makers whose browsers just go dark under certain conditions are going to get a lot more complaints than, let's say, China is going to get. Right? Nobody bothers complaining to China about the traffic they refuse to allow through the Great Firewall. Um, so this seems naive. It's like uh, the people who are doing this are just now discovering how the world works one step at a time. That's why they were panicked when they saw the Snowden disclosures, and that's why they think they can sort of move humanity, move the needle on human uh, privacy and autonomy using network protocols. Uh, I started the first anti-spam company. Let me tell you, you can't. It doesn't work like that. So what are we all going to do? Now, some people are just going to say, I am small. They are large. Uh, I cannot afford to join this battle. Um, so I'm just going to have to sit back and let it happen and uh, stop being responsible for the traffic emanating from my network and hope that people don't disconnect me or firewall me off because I've got too many DDoSs coming. Some, in fact, that will be the vast majority of the response to this. Um, government agencies, military, 
large corporations or people like me are going to say, wait, you know, I can't afford and I must afford to fight this battle. I cannot allow the policy of my network or the ability to have a policy on, uh, on my network be dictated by the IETF. Uh, and so I can tell you what some of us will do is say, all right, uh, I see your TLS 1.3 with the encrypted client hello. I see that you're doing that. And because of that, I am no longer going to permit uh, endpoints on my network to make connections to the outside world. I'm going to assign a proxy. I'm going to tell you the local host name of that proxy. I'm going to tell you the key that that proxy is using. And then you are going to do everything through that proxy, which is going to then decrypt everything you try to transmit and everything you try to receive in order to find out if it meets or does not meet policy. And then if there's no pol policy violation, then I will regenerate it for you toward the outside or toward you um, using a key that you will trust. And uh, boy, that's draconian. You, you want to talk about loss of human freedom, loss of privacy, loss of sovereignty. If I have to strip search all data going through my network, I can't just kind of look at the headers to find out what host name you were using, but I can't see the rest, then that's a net loss. But I can't afford not to do it. And a lot of entities, probably in, including some of the entities in this room, are going to have to behave that way as a matter of national law. So um, I will also be continuing to do what I've always done, which is that uh, to treat UDP as a privileged protocol. In other words, if you want to speak UDP, you've got to be my name server. Um, I'm, just, I'm not going to just allow random UDP flows to pass through my network. And the reason I have never allowed this, even for things like NTP, UDP port 123, is because it can be used like this. Once you have a packet transport, you can create something like QUIC that will behave like a reliable transport. Um, this has always been possible, and so I have always treated UDP as privileged. Um, i got to tell you that the gamers in my family don't love this because um, TCP is too slow for multi-person shoot 'em ups and so people who you know want to sit on their PC and you know uh, shoot characters on the screen are, need UDP and so I have had kind of a long battle of trying to enumerate what is actually needed um, so this is expensive this is going to add more complexity and I think I mentioned earlier that adding complexity without bound, without a plan, is how we got to the place where we can't secure our networks. So I don't like being pushed in the direction where I'm going to be giving my end users even less privacy and uh, even less autonomy in order to protect my rights as a network owner uh, to control what my network emanates. So. Um, the right thing to have done if you were the IETF, in my opinion, is to say, you know, there will be people, who, uh, companies and government agencies and so forth who cannot allow this to happen. Um, they only have bad choices. They're going to be in a terrible position and they're going to do terrible things because of the position we're about to put them in. Let's negotiate. Let's find something that we can do that is, you know, a fix to the problem that doesn't create new, worse problems. Um, but if you've been paying attention for the last couple of decades, you know that what's going to happen is innovation and chaos. Um, one of the nice things that happens uh, when you do firewall stuff is that you look like a malware researcher to the malware. And malware is constantly afraid that it's running in an emulator, uh, being single-stepped, so that it can be studied. And so if it sees like bizarre timing, like this instruction took too long, it'll sometimes pull the, uh, hit the, the, the big red button and say, I am not going to behave maliciously because I don't want what I think is probably a security researcher to be able to disassemble my code and figure out how I'm doing it. And it turns out that these firewalls perfectly mimic a security researcher. So you might end up with a more secure network just because the malware that does get in is not going to be willing to try and operate once it detects your firewall. So I guess there could be a silver lining. 
Now, the way that the internet was originally thought of is that you had, you know, users and apps going through various, you know, clients and so forth, reaching uh, through ISPs and eventually getting to a server. And any of those people could decide, you know, I don't, I don't like this traffic. It's, you know, whatever. It's, it looks too much like a DDoS or it's too many packets per second. Whatever the reason is, you could close those gates. Um, but the problem is that this design allows unlimited abuse by nation state actors and ISPs. And so the response is uh, to make sure that none of those gates can be closed because you can't distinguish one type of traffic from another. So there's a book that came out a few years ago, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And I have met the author, uh, and I gotta, I gotta say she is a once in a generation talent. Right? So of the tens of millions of people who were born during her, the decade that she was born, she is in the top several in terms of how clearly she sees things and how clearly she, she can explain them. Um, and she said this years before Quick. <laughs> she didn't, she wasn't trying to be very specific. She could just see what big tech was doing. Um, and, you know, big tech is both part of the solution and part of the problem, right? The, uh, if an ISP is able to see what your end users are doing, then they could compete with you in the advertising market. And Comcast famously sued Google on exactly that basis. Um, so it's really in Google's best interest that all of this stuff be unintelligible to ISPs. They may not care about the uh, nation state actors, but they would certainly care about anybody being able to find out what their Chromecast is doing or anything else. The challenges of epistemic justice, epistemic just means how you know things. Epistemic justice and epistemic rights in this new era are summarized in three essential questions about knowledge, authority, and power. First, who knows? Second, who decides who knows? And third, who decides who decides who knows? Well, when I saw that um, the internet was for end users, I, I took stock. Uh, specifically, I examined my, my own skull. I looked all over my own skull for a Cat5 jack. I did not find one. So if the internet is for end users, then the internet is actually for the makers of our smartphones. And uh, we are the product. And uh, with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you for the um, interesting and yes, uh, cheerful in a way <laughs> talk. Uh, so, uh, do we have? First of all, do we have questions in in Zoom? You can raise your hand in Zoom. Just to. Or otherwise, do we have questions in the room? Yep. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so when do you think the quick is going to be widely implemented? If you look at the uh, NetFlow going through your gateway from whatever networks you are responsible for toward the rest of the Internet, you will quickly discover that it is already being deployed and that it may even be 1 or 2 percent of your total traffic your permission was not sought, nor would it be sought. So in terms of when it will be widely deployed, um, I would say it can't take more than another year or two before the tipping point is reached and more than half your traffic is this rather than TCP. And that's simply because the web is responsible for most of the traffic that we carry. And the web is mostly operated through these browsers, and there are only really two browsers anymore, uh, possibly three if you count Safari. Um, 
So when those browsers adopt this, they will adopt it by, again, attempting QUIC and then falling back to TCP if QUIC isn't working. Now, QUIC not working could be because the web server you're trying to talk to or the whatever, the, the, the proxy, the CDN, the load balancer you're trying to talk to doesn't support QUIC. Or it could be that the uh, firewall simply doesn't permit random UDP. Um, and what that means is that deployment is likely to track the number of servers who are able to answer this way. And a lot of the servers are just using some kind of a, a web development kit. You know, if you think about your average uh, Go, Golang program or uh, Python program, you know, it's not doing all the work of opening sockets and doing, you know, listening for connections and so forth. It's got a fairly high level thing built into the library. I want to open a connection. Here's, you know, here, here's where it is. And if that library silently decides to also permit quick, then next time you revise that, unless you pay, you know, run Nmap against it to see if anything has changed, you might discover that you're suddenly supporting quick without even knowing it. So I think uh, we have two years at the most before this is the dominant form of web traffic. They've just revised the version number from quick version one to quick version two. They, and this is again, this is a really smart thing done by really good engineers. They changed nothing. They did not make any changes to the packet format itself. They just changed the version number because they wanted to make sure that version negotiation would work before this thing got big. Um, so that's happening right now, and you know the, this whole thing is designed to sort of slide right in, zero infer insertion force. Um, if you want to measure it, use NetFlow. If you want to stop it, use your firewall. Hi there. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, you made it clear at the beginning that uh, these are your opinions. They do not necessarily reflect your employer's uh, opinions. That is true. Can you comment on what your employer's opinions about your opinions are? Um, it's a good chance they don't know I'm here, but um, the uh, I think to the extent that if this is to be done, it should be done well, there are probably colleagues of mine inside of Amazon who have participated in testing and implementing and, you know, uh, again, it's not necessarily because the company thinks this is a good idea, but because this is the way the web is going and the W in AWS stands for web, so uh, it's a good chance that we are going to be ready when everybody needs needs us to be ready. Yes, sir. So um, when I talk to people about privacy, um, sometimes I feel, um, well, sad or disappointed uh, when they say the, the ma magic sentence, um, what do I have to hide, right? I have nothing to hide. Or what would uh, someone else um, um, look for me? And um, correlating this idea with here on our field about the research and education, where um, particle physics is kind of um, open, uh, we publish all the results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, my question is, what would you explain to a small university that is running physics data about why would you need to protect that much um, your infrastructure? What would you need to look for zero days or super advanced threats? Um, if you can buy uh, one firewall and stop 99% of your attacks? Well, 99% is a very good sounding number. Um, but, you know, it is uh, slightly less than 1.0. And so if everybody is doing 99%, then you have to take the product, you have to multiply all those 99% together you'll find that it quickly, before the population gets very large, it, very, it quickly drops a, a long way from 99% in terms of end-to-end -end effectiveness. Um, so usually when somebody talks about that, it's like, yeah, they've been reading too many press releases. But um, 
What I would tell a small university is uh, that the data that you intend to exchange with the world, you know, the high energy physics, you know, telemetry type stuff or, you know, whatever, uh, is not your problem. I mean, it could be a problem if some bad actor decided either for lulls or for because they were attacking your economy, they wanted to pervert that data. They wanted your data to become wrong. They might break into your systems for the purpose of uh, reducing your credibility and causing a lot of other people to go on a wild goose chase because the results that you're reporting are not the ones you saw. So there are some problems, but the biggest single problem is that you don't want to get black holed. You don't want to show up in some reputation system like Spam House as a place that spam or DDoS or something else is coming from uh, because that will potentially affect your ability to deliver your results as you intend. And so you have to take responsibility for what's running on your network uh, over and above just making sure that your own data remains safe. And I don't think that means keeping it private, right, because of the publication is, is the purpose of science. Um, we're not generating secret data here unless it's a weapons program. Um, but you, you, you have to be able to take responsibility for the signals emanating from your network. Um, and if you can't, that will threaten your ultimate <coughs> success. You, you can't just... Uh, hope for the best. We know that all software ever published has had bugs. We should not expect that to suddenly change. Um, a lot of those bugs are vulnerabilities. A lot of them show up as zero days. Um, you have to know what's running. And you have to know what it's doing. Um, so there, there's no escape from responsibility. But do you think that we can uh, play this reputation uh, card? Because um, in my opinion, when there is a breach, uh, millions of passwords and users are, are compromised, and this is published, it seems that in less than a month, everything is, is um, completely wiped. I mean, every, everyone forgets about, about this case. So do you think that um, someone really cares, or these small universities would really care to be on the spam house? Well, so let's forget about Spam House for a moment, and let's imagine that um, because you did not uh, update your mail server, email server, your SMTP server to the latest, greatest version, uh, or you, don't, you have a, some problem in your SPF or your DKIM or some other configuration for it, that you are no longer able to send mail to Gmail that university would certainly feel the pain from that. And um, if we could organize reputation systems so that they were always transparent, you know who was blocking you and why and what you had to do to get it to stop, um, life would be good. But that's not the situation we're in. I actually did what I just said. I was unable to send anything to Gmail. And you know I've got kids who have Gmail addresses, so they divided my family. And they wouldn't tell me why. They, uh, they had a bunch of cir circular reasoning with circular pointers on their website telling me what, uh, you know, why this was probably so, but nothing specific. I ultimately had to renumber that, name ser that mail server in order to once again be able to reach my own family. That's, that's what I mean by innovation and chaos here. And I don't know how to bottle that up into something you can print on a T-shirt that will be compelling to a small university. You're going to have to tell the longer story. So now, if you were to talk to a large lab like CERN uh, about recommendations, uh, from the lesson you had from your uh, family experience that people trying to shoot uh, virtual enemies during using UDP traffic. Uh, we have physicists shooting particles using UDP traffic and the same kind of problems. What recommendation would you make to an organization that is uh, agreeing to your cause and principles but has to face a reality that we have users who have conflicting requirements with our ideas and priorities in terms of security? Well, from around 2009 until around 2021, I worked in the 
passive DNS collection and analysis industry. And um, we absolutely relied on UDP, not just because that's what DNS uses, but because we couldn't afford to burn any network or CPU or any other resources retransmitting something during periods of congestion. We wanted loss to remain loss, and that required UDP. Um, we learned that wide area UDP normally doesn't work, either because of packet size issues or firewalls or you know whatever it's going to be. And so we ended up having it be that when we wanted to do the equivalent of uh, measuring particles coming out of an accelerator and send the data to a collector, we needed to do that on our own campus. And then the collector on our own campus would then use some non-UDP protocol to then share that uh, across the internet itself, the wide area network, to our partners. Uh, and that's just, that was the reality of trying to use UDP. Um, even NTP has a, and SNMP and NFS and so forth. The most most UDP-based protocols uh, behave very poorly when the latency gets above about 10 milliseconds. Um, so that is the direction I would take with you know a science team at CERN. I, I know they're using UDP and I know why and I think it's a great thing. But they should not be able, uh, not be expecting to be able to get their UDP flow from Geneva to Livermore. Over here. Since since Quick is still based on UDP and thus I understand an IP below, do you think there's any hope to like have some you know protection based on IP reputation on or like who you talk to? With like now we have like big actors like multiplexing basically, and you don't know really like who an IP domain is or what is behind? So uh, I think no. And I would think that even if one of the passionate activists hadn't spoken specifically to that issue. Um, but let's take Cloudflare for an example. Right? They host tens of millions of web properties um, and they have mirrors everywhere and load balancers and all sorts of things. You know, it, it's a pretty solid system in terms of web publication. It means that you can make your content available to the world without worrying too much about the power of your server or your network connection. And now they, have, they have a lot of competitors, but they are unique in embracing intellectual property damage. Um, they, they are totally willing to host a MP3 or MP4 or whatever uh, service that is full of licensed content from Hollywood or elsewhere. Uh, and if you complain and say, that's my content, uh, you're doing the bad thing, then they'll say, yeah, sue us. And if you sue them, you'll be in for a long fight. Um, and what that means is, it's a real temptation to just say, look, if you're going to be non-cooperative, in a way, on a network that has always relied on cooperation to exist at all, then to hell with you. And I'm, I'm just not going to allow any connection to Cloudflare. That temptation is real, but it is naive. Because of the tens of millions of things that they host, most are not intellectual property damaging. And you can't cut yourself off from the whole just because you don't like some of the parts. Now in the TLS 1.2 world, it was possible to, to have a list of the things you didn't want to have work. And that's one of the reasons that TLS 1.3 is so valuable to the content industry. They don't want you to be able to make those choices. Their interests are not aligned with yours. So we're not going to get very far looking at the IP address and trying to make decisions about that. Now there's an exception, and that is DNS over HTTPS. Um, there are plenty of lists of all the DOH servers on the internet, um, and they are published by people who think that, uh, yeah, you should never face DNS filtering by your ISP. So if you are, here's the list of places you could send your, your DOH traffic. Well, that's great for me because, you know, I, I surf all of those periodically and find all the IP addresses and simply say, no, there will be no traffic to those addresses. 
And I let Cloudflare know that early enough that they decided to not put the, uh, their DNS over HTTP service on the same IP address as their main web service because they knew what I would do, they knew what I would recommend, and they knew what a lot of other people would have to do in order to retain control of their own ability to have DNS policy. And so I think that's a case where trying to keep track of the IP addresses that are mostly being used for this is practical. But for the web itself, no. Last question. Uh, not really a question, uh, just uh, some comments. To the first question about adoption, well, uh, that's coming from Google, so everybody here using Chrome, you're using Quick, even without knowing, accessing all the Google uh, services, exactly from what Paul explained, that uh, they want to be the only ones having that visibility, not the ISP. Uh, then about uh, decrypting uh, the server name inside uh, Quick Package. Uh, it can be done, a little snitch, which is an absolutely brilliant uh, House firewall on the Mac has that ability to do it. I'm not exactly sure how they do it because it's closed source, but uh, there is a way of uh, decrypting and blocking because whenever there is a quick uh, connection attempt, you get a prompt from LittleSnitch with the exact domain. So, yeah. I'll put the link in the, the Zoom channel. I am hardened by that, but I'll stand by my earlier remarks. If there is a weakness discovered in Quick, they will strengthen Quick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, I share your pain with uh, email. Uh, basically, nowadays, you only have two main email providers, either Google or Microsoft. And good luck getting anything else to, to pass and be delivered to these two corporations. Uh, and getting any answer from them why your mail is just disappear. Uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. That's all we have time for. Thank you all for spending this hour with me. I know that uh, it's an hour you'll never get back. I hope I made it worth your while. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>